Um, should we move on to the uh, so the, there's a there's a lot more uh, in your book than uh, just a, a pro nuclear arguments. And one of the things I really appreciate is and this concept of degrowth. And I've heard it a little bit more uh, this summer. And, you know, you introduce us to a lot of figures who are pretty uh, crazy, I would say like anti-human um, almost and, you know, really far out there. But you also do a good job, I think, of steel manning uh, your uh, position or your arguments here by pegging them to somebody who you give credit, like Naomi Klein, uh, who's written a lot about climate. You give a credit for like foregrounding labor, for instance, in a way a lot of these folks don't. Uh, but I wonder if you could just fo- uh, forgive us, folks, outline your critique of uh, degrowth as sort of uh, pervaded by Naomi Klein and others. So we should probably define what degrowth means. Um, right. In effect, the the argument is that the the cause of environmental problems uh, is the growth in um, uh, in the economy, the increasing use of stuff. Um, the in some cases, people say the increased um, uh, population, um, uh, and that we need to uh, recognize that there are limits to uh, to natural systems, and we, we need to respect those limits. So we need to stop having economic growth. What is economic growth? Economic growth is the creation of net new value. Uh, so we cannot create any new value in society. So that's the that's the basic that's the basic argument. Um, I would, you know, it's, again, to really steel man these people, uh, they don't simply say that um, um, that's the whole of the story. There should also be a sharing out of all uh, wealth in society. So, you know, something very sympath- uh, that socialists would be very sympathetic to, um, which means that uh, the, the wealth of uh, the Western world would have to contract. So actually degrow, not merely stop growing further, but degrow and allow the developing world to grow to our level I mean, one of my frustrations here is that who's we who's us there's class divisions in our own society never mind let's just assume that everybody has the same level of wealth in the west which is bonkers but anyway um that they would uh, the developing world would rise up to our level my primary there are many many different aspects of this that i find abhorrent with respect to a classical socialist social democratic or trade unionist um perspective um, for the last 40 plus years, uh, Western workers um, across the United States, Canada, uh, Western Europe, Australia, Japan, um, have suffered through um, uh, either stagnating or even contracting wages, suffered through deindustrialization, suffered through massive increases in inequality. Um, and so the logical consequence of telling Western workers that they need to contract their standard of living by some considerable amount. And I can attach some numbers to this in a second of what this actually would mean. Um, is Thatcherism or Reaganism by another name? It's eco-Thatcherism. Um, how dare they ask uh, Western workers who are already suffering uh, to suffer still more? Mm-hmm. Uh, now their response is, oh, but you know, we're not saying that you won't, uh, that your life will be worse because we're going to have free public education and free universities and free healthcare and free transportation and bikes. And um, I have to respond that, like, outside of the United States where you don't have free uh, healthcare for everybody, um, all of those things that you've just listed are things that all Western workers have to a greater or lesser extent already so the only section that you we in canada in uh in britain in france in in germany um our our healthcare is free for the most part Mm -hmm. uh our our, our, we have strong public health public education systems it's free um in many places in western europe university and college education is free it is in canada but it is in so this package of things that you're the degrowthers are promising um, the, the only thing where there will be any cuts is in the stuff that we buy. Well, my exp- the experience of so many people over the last uh, 40 years or so isn't merely in the fact that our uh, social services aren't as good as they used to be. It is also in the fact that we, we can't buy more stuff. We can't go on mm-hmm. holiday as we used to. Um, food is expensive. 
Um, housing, my God, is super expensive. Um, uh, so you are actually telling these people, the degrowthers are telling the Western workers that they do need to uh, collapse their, their standards of living. And the, the often thing that I come across in the discussions here are they will usually talk, they love to talk about Happy Meals and uh, Barbie dolls and the plastic toys you get in Happy Meals mm -hmm. and, and uh, flat screen TVs and Xboxes. And to my mind, I mean, yeah, sure, maybe under a social society, we would choose a different set of, of, of fun items to, to, to produce. Maybe we wouldn't use as much plastic. I don't know. What if, it probably would be slightly different or maybe significantly different from what we currently produce. But I just have this very sort of like allergic reaction to what I feel is a very sort of like a class snobbery around these things. Um, why do you care about a Barbie doll or a little plastic toy in a Happy Meal, uh, which in terms of the energy uh, uh, use or material use per unit of fun enjoyed by the, the kid is much greater, it's much more efficient than let's say the uh, wooden um, uh, train set that you hand carved uh, locally sourced train set bought from some farmer's market that sits on a shelf and looks pretty and impresses any any neighbors that come by but the kid never fucking uses <laughs> uh, it's much more materially intensive much more energetically intensive and nobody will ever uh, sneer at uh, the the waste mm. of that wooden train set uh, and I think it really does come down to class and class aesthetics, that there's a real sort of middle class uh, snobbery around the fact that some people um, go to McDonald's and get a Happy Meal and enjoy it. Uh, I mean, I, sorry, in my experience talking with folks, I think that's a huge bit of it. I mean, it's all this conversation about plastic and hamburgers, right? And I think that that sort of shows that this is like a very aesthetic uh, critique versus like a political one, right? And like, you know, I mean, certainly there's lots of things that we should be like in, in a socialist society. There are things that I think we would be wanting to put more energy into um, versus what we're, what we're currently seeing. But this kind of like, it's, it's a very kind of Christian um, mentality where it's like the West has had it too good. They need to be punished. And yeah. I don't know. I mean, the, the degrowthers sort of do span such a large group of folks that it's hard to ever pinpoint it, but maybe I'll just note this. Like, one line that I've always thought has been very good from like the anti-imperialist left, left is something that comes from Michael Parenti, where he says there aren't poor countries and rich countries. There are poor people and rich people. And for some reason, when it comes to this fight, people just drop that that uh, mentality. Right. Yeah. Like, oh, the Western workers are, you know, they're they're enjoying too much good stuff um, and also ignore the fact that the right wing is predisposed for this um, new historical moment, right? Like, look, we've been covering the the train strikes in the U United Kingdom, and yeah. we had this really great clip of um, Mick Lynch. Um, he's awesome. Hey. He, you know, he's a killer. He's a hero for dark times, indeed. Um, but you know, one of these Tory politicians was coming at him, and coming at him for how this stri strike is hurting the um, environmental movement in this country. Right. And, you know, a small example, but it's just like that's what's coming. We can go through Macron and all these other folks, but like they are very I'm sorry if you've seen anything in your lifetime and you don't think that the kind of established powers that be in the society are not going to glom on to any kind of politics um, of less. Um, you know, you're 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 very, very mistaken. And in fact, it is going to get very, very dangerous really quickly because that's not even the dominant of politics right now. And they're already ready for it. Oh, yeah. And, and what's really disappointing is when we see people on the left or liberal left participating in that, either willingly or un, un, unwittingly. Um, mm -hmm. Recent discussions about limiting the um, or regulating uh, regulations with respect to the import of, um, of solar panels from uh, from China, particularly and, and, and how much of it this is produced in Xinjiang uh, by effectively slave labor. And it's not merely the panels themselves, but also the, the sort of inputs into panels. So even if you source it from somewhere, those panels from somewhere else in the world, uh, so many of the inputs come from this region that you can't really say that um, it, it's free of uh, some part of that was produced by slave labor. And the, the, the number of progressives in the United States who lined up to oppose any uh, restrictions um, on that, uh, I feel were, you know, you're, you're throwing labor, Chinese labor under the bus there uh, in the service of 
uh, installation of variable renewables uh, that don't even do a very good job or don't do as good a job of delivering clean transition as some of these made in America um, um, uh, or made in Canada or made in France, um, uh, reliable clean sources like nuclear. And also yeah. just like on that, like coming at the, you know, our American progressives, like very willing to talk about, you know, the conditions that, that workers are facing in that part of the world under other circumstances. But the second that there's the green veneer, like they drop out. And yeah. I think that that's exactly. something that's very worrying um, to me. Like even if you say, oh, well, it's all U.S. propaganda, right? I'm not saying that, but like, let's just say you take that position. Um, you know, the willingness of those of, of those people in power to just like flip a switch where it's like, we're not very worried about it in this circumstance, but you know what? I mean, we are very worried about it, um, but the second it touches the green industry, you know what? This is the price that we have to pay for modernization, right? That's a very, very scary um, political moment to to be opening the door to. 100%. We, we've got to be always um, uh, have a radar out for how uh, some green discourses um, can be used by elites, by, uh, by the bosses uh, to undermine workers' rights. Uh, to undermine that you, you, you're talking uh, talking there about Mick Lynch and uh, a Tory minister. I mean, that's just fucking classic, isn't it? Let's use mm -hmm. this sort of degrowthist uh, in order to keep wages down, or to blame those people when they want higher wages. Like, oh, you, you're undermining the, the clean transition. When actually we've got a whole great ser uh, uh, series of options that not merely. Uh, do a better job of decarbonizing more rapidly, uh, delivering a firm electricity grid, allowing clean aviation to continue to allow migrants to arrive in the United States or Canada um, and allow for Hawaiians and Puerto Ricans to participate in their national democracy, um, um, do a better job or more easily unionizable uh, work. Uh, uh, workplaces, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, like it's it's all there. We have a better set of solutions than these uh, these these other guys. Um, and I just wish that there were. I wouldn't say I wish because I think it is beginning to change. I think folks like myself, you guys having this conversation, uh, Matt Huber, Fred Stafford, Basir Sankara. Uh, there's a lot of folks, and actually, labor itself. This is the mm -hmm. other important part: is that labor is waking up to this issue. Um, and they are beginning to uh, push back and say, we know more about these systems. We need to take a, uh, away the, the climate uh, conversation from the PMC um, uh, trade unions, journalists and academics. And we need to be leading on this, just steal the whole conversation from them. No, I mean... Could you help us work through this this question too? Because it's it's one of the, it's certainly in the degrowth stuff, but I think this is just sort of like a pop political understanding that a lot of people have about climate and hey disease, like a lot of things that are going on. That there's this big fear about overpopulation, um, and and like that being the the cause of all this. I mean, could you could you speak um, you know to that phenomenon and maybe even to some people who from you know whatever sources they're getting that information from why they are very, very wrong about overpopulation being the biggest threat that mankind has ever faced. Yeah, sure. So overpopulation uh, fears date back to Reverend Malthus, uh, in the uh, 18th century an early economist. Um, uh, and he argued that the, uh, the rate of growth in population would outstrip the, the rate of growth in uh, food production. And so uh, there needed to be, uh, um, basically there needs to be a collapse in, um, in, in, in population in order to, to uh, for food production to match uh, population. So he argued against um, uh, any sort of benefits to, uh, to the working poor. He, he said that they should just <clears throat> die off. Um, Today, well, I mean, this 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 set of ideas has uh, repeated itself over and over again in a sort of more environmental guise um, since the 19th century, uh, the interwar period um, on the far right, um, and then in the, again in the 1960s, the Sierra Club, um, uh, Earth First, uh, you know, the, the the sort of radical environmentalists of the 1980s and 1990s, one of their founders, Dave Foreman, famously said, you know, during the, the AIDS crisis, uh, felt that this was Gaia, the, you know, Earth, Mother, sort of 
um, correcting a human overpopulation. He said, uh, similarly, with respect to the Ethiopian Jesus famine, Christ. it is really grotesque stuff. But here's the thing. It isn't just in the, the, the fringes, the, the extremes. Um, um, uh, David Attenborough, the beloved, you know, 80 um, something year old uh, nature documentarian is the is a patron of the uh, what used to be called the op op Optimum Population Trust. And now it's called Population Matters. And this is an organization that, uh, that campaigns around um, overpopulation. And uh, some of their positions include have included. Uh, so during the, uh, the the Syrian refugee crisis, that the UK it's a UK based um, um, organization that the UK should not accept any um, uh, Syrian uh, Syrian refugees. And the rationale behind this is that if those refugees come to Britain, um, those refugees will live the same sort of lifestyles as Britons. Uh, which are uh, you know have enormous in environmental impacts they're using too many material item, material resources too much energy uh the very worst thing that could happen is for everybody to live a western lifestyle so-called western lifestyle this was the same with sierra club in the united states in the 1980s and 1990s um the identical argument uh, that there needs to be uh, uh you know a trumpian a pre-trumpian border wall to prevent any Mexicans or Guatemalans or whoever from living American lifestyles because American lifestyles are um, all ready to um, uh, use up too many uh, natural resources. It keeps happening over and over and over again. Now, you will get degrowthers today who will say, no, no, we're only talking about economic growth, not population growth, and we're very fervently in favor of, um, of, of, of migrant rights. Um, but and we, yeah, we don't want to talk about overpopulation, but the, the, they're just not following their argument to its logical conclusion. If, let's say, you have uh, zero new economic growth, but you're not uh, doing anything to constrain population growth. And remember, you've shared um, um, wealth completely equally around the world. Well, the minute that you have one new baby, all that wealth that is equally shared around the world has to be smaller. And then you have two babies and then 100 babies and a million babies. Well, the wealth of everybody begins to get smaller and smaller and smaller, trending towards if the population, if you have no, you're not, you're not desiring any constraint to population growth, population will continue, but you can't have any increase in wealth, any increase in net um, um, uh, value, that the amount of wealth controlled by or own or a portion to every individual person will tend towards zero. So inevitably, um, economic uh, unless you introduce some sort of population caps. So uh, inevitably, um, uh, uh, degrowth, uh, anti-economic growth uh, perspectives entail, as a logical consequence, um, uh, anti uh, sort of overpopulation arguments. And this is why many environmentalists uh, like David Attenborough, Jane Goodall, um, other very famous figures, Prince Charles, um, uh, make the argument that. Uh, if you're talking about um, uh, limiting economic growth, you have to talk about population. It's a logical mm -hmm. consequence. And I think, to be fair, those people at least are taking the argument to a logical conclusion. The other people are just, there's cognitive dissonance. They're not realizing this. One set of ideas entails this other set of ideas. Can you uh, share with folks your thought experiment about which year should we return to? <laughs> Yeah, okay, so in austerity ecology, I, I, I noticed that um, uh, different folks on the green left or just in sort of austerian uh, mindset, um, all of them want to return us back to some particular period, some Arcadia in the past before everything went awry. And uh, Naomi Klein at one point in This Changes Everything sort of says the 1970s were sort of the high point and we should just return to that. At another point in the book, she talks about that sort of, um, uh, Christian domination of nature was the original sin. And so maybe we need to return back to a sort of um, uh, pre, um, sort of pre Judeo Christian uh, era. Um, uh, there are other figures who, like, oh, what's his name? Um, He's the head of 350.org, former New Yorker writer, Bill McKibben. McKibben. Uh, his, in his books, he thinks that early America, Jeffersonian uh, yeoman farmers, that was the optimum period uh, that we should return to. Um, 
there's a uh, there's a British um, environmental writer who was the founder of the Dark Mountain Group, which is this very sort of pessimistic environmental um, or um, and sort of literary organization. I uh, can't remember his name either. Um, anyway, uh, he talks about return back to sort of. Uh, 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 pre-English Civil War period. And it's a very sort of English, there's a sense of English nationalism that everything went wrong when basically the Normans invaded. Um, and I feel that none of these have any sort of solid scientific basis in terms of use of materials or energy uh, inputs, uh, but each of them sort of rather speak to the, the aesthetics whoever, of whichever writing uh, writer is writing about a particular period that I think it's just that Bill McKibben probably just really likes that period of American history and that <laughs> this dark mountain guy just really, really likes and has this aesthetic attraction to pre, uh, U, uh, e, I'm sorry, UK, uh, British, sorry, English Civil War, um, uh, Britain. Um, it's it's just very amusing. I mean, also, what on the left we should be saying is that we, we've never been about a retreat from mm -hmm. modernity, a retreat from capitalism. You read the the Communist Manifesto, is probably. The, the single greatest uh, uh, homage to the wonders of capitalist modernity that has ever been written. And he says, at the same time, it has all these marvels and these horrors. How effectively, how do we strip um, the system and modernity in industry of the horrors while maintaining the, the marvels? Mm. Uh, we had, uh, for the very beginnings of the socialist movement, we argued that um, that we could have so much more. I mean, Marx again in mm -hmm. the manifesto and throughout his writings is talking about how um, capitalist production in the marketplace is irrational in that it limits production only to those things that are profitable. There are so many other things. The set of all things that are useful to humans is so much larger than the set of things, the, the small set of things that are that are profitable. To take just one contemporary example, so to really make this concrete, we're currently suffering through a crisis of antimicrobial resistance. Our uh, our, our old families and classes of antibiotics just aren't working the way that they used to. We need to invest in uh, development of new antibiotics. Now, a lot of those sort of new uh, antibiotics, uh, classes of antibiotics, or even new ways to deal with um, um, uh, uh, microbe pathogen, microbial pathogens, um, is actually sitting on a shelf in, in, a, uh, in a lab. Uh, there's lots of different options, but uh, the ma major pharmaceutical companies largely got out of the business of, of uh, research and development and, and commercialization of these because they're insufficiently profitable, basically because the, you know, you, the, once you take a course of antibiotics for a few days or a few weeks, or in the case of tuberculosis, a few months, if the drug is working, you don't ever have to take that drug again, unless you get infected again. Mm -hmm. uh, whereas if you are suffering from some chronic disease, you have to take a drug every day for the rest of your life. And that is much more profitable. And so they largely got out of the business of this. Anyway, so that is that is that is a, that is what uh, new classes of antibiotic is one clear example of a uh, product that we would produce under uh, socialism that isn't uh, capable of being produced under capitalism. Um, again, endorsing the the, the 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 classic Marxist argument that we would produce so much more of utility to humanity than uh, the, the small set of things that uh, the capitalism able to produce. Our promise, the socialist promise was always life would be so much better, so much richer. And the degrowthers, the limits to growth people, instead of promising life that it was so much better, they promise life will be so much worse. Follow me, I will make things worse for you. Yeah, well, I mean, if we're going to return back to the time of Charles II, that's going to be a uh, uh, big news for horses. <laughs> we're going to have to start. Um, <laughs> we're going to have to start <laughs> breeding some horses because I don't know how we're going to get around. <laughs> but uh, yeah, go ahead. No, I think that's phenomenal. I mean, if <clears throat> you're 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 you know you're hitting at it um, throughout this this interview, but I think one thing that might be really helpful. And I know this is a big question. Um, but I think it would be really helpful for some folks who are maybe on the fence, because I think a lot of reasons, maybe not the degrowthers as an intellectual movement, but maybe like the fans, the people who are you know reading into this, especially on the left, they're like, oh, well, this is anti-growth and that means it's anti-capitalism, right? Um, which I think is, is, is a mistake. I mean, could you help us detangle um, growth from capitalism as a system? Because I think 
there that is like a heart of why a lot of people become attracted to this um and might misunderstand what we're arguing for too because we're not saying that everything's perfect right now no no, um, no. Or that there's not a lot of irrational production but we're saying that like growth in and of itself is not the problem it's the way that things are distributed and it's for what purpose they're distributed but please uh help us detangle this a little bit Sure. So, so economic growth is simply the the creation of net new economic value of anything of of any utility uh, utility to humanity. Um, there's a lot of confusion around. So, you're defending uh, GDP growth? No, I think GDP is probably a kind of shitty way to measure um, um, increase in value to uh, for for humanity. Um, there are other metrics that we could use, but more importantly. In any socialist society, one would imagine that we would continue to engage in scientific discovery and and technol and technol invention of new technologies, new medicines. Um, all of that is creation of new value. If you are saying we can't have any new value, you're saying we're not going to invent anything anymore. We're not going to um, engage in any more new scientific discovery. We're not going to invent in a, any new medicines. And some of them, some of the degrowthers, to their, uh, uh, some of them don't sort of clock that this is what this means. Other ones, to their credit, recognize this does mean this is it. This we have enough. We don't need any more. We're not going to steadily expand um, uh, the degrees of freedom that humans have. We're done. This is the best it's ever going to get. Um, uh, I mean, Troy Vitesi and Drew Pendergrass's new book, Half Earth Social, published by Verso. I mean, there's, there's a part of the book where it's, it, it, uh, I mean, this is the latest sort of new green left book that's being celebrated. Um, there's a part of the book where it says, yeah, this, this is it. We're not going to be developing anything. We should just be comfortable with what we have. And um, I, I, <clears throat> there's two things I would say there. One is that, um, Again, one of the socialist arguments has always been the, the limitation of production uh, on the market, um, as I was saying a few seconds ago, limits production to, to what is profitable. Um, so there's a whole universe and an infinite infinitude of things that we could discover and develop and expand human freedom as a result of those new technologies that capitalism just will not do. So that's part of the promise that we, we, uh, we've always made. The second thing I would say is that with respect to environmental problems, um, there will not be a world without um, environmental problems. There will always be a world with problems. As we uh, develop so solutions to the problems that we, are, uh, we currently are, uh, confront, solve those problems with new technologies, new systems or new processes or new social relations. And social relations are effectively a technology as well, or technologies are just frozen, crystallized social relations. Um, as a result of that, there will be some unintended consequence. There will be new problems that are thrown up. So we have to solve those. And then as a result of solving those problems, new problems are thrown up. That is a human story. That is, we will never not do that. Stop doing that. Um, even the, uh, the the degrowth proposal it is its own set of uh, solutions that comes with its own set of problems. Um, I think there's a, a there's a sort of belief that we that co that socialism communism uh, promises a world without problems. No, we just promise a world that has far fewer problems than capitalism would have. Um, the all of our environmental problems fundamentally come down to the fact that we at some point discover in the process of solving a solution, solving a problem, that the solution that we came up with has this, this problem. The, um, the market actors that produce commodities um, related to the discovery of that, that problem have an interest in maintaining production of that. They have an interest in preventing the re regulation of that or, or um, banning of that, that particular substance or commodity. And so they will lobby and delay um, and cheat and break laws to make sure that their profits are maintained. I mean, this is what we, we, we saw since the 1970s when um, uh, some of the oil and gas companies were some of the first um, uh, humans to mm -hmm. recognize the full extent of, of climate change and they buried their, uh, uh, their research because it was so threatening to uh, uh, to profit making 
if we um, are producing for need rather than profit, the minute that we discover that one of our solutions has a new environment, is posing a new environmental problem, we can then begin to, okay, th there's nobody holding back. There's nobody lobbying to, to try to maintain uh, the, their profits. We just say, okay, here's this other uh, technology, an alternative um, uh, that we could use instead. And we will move the workers from this sector to this sector. And the state can just simply do that. We just turn off that, that technology. Or if there isn't a technology um, that is easily, uh, you can swap out easily. Again, we can just, uh, we can spend the money, spend the, uh, the, the, the human resources and material to produce uh, that, uh, to develop that new technology. Um, so there is already a whole suite of arguments that we on the left as, as so, and the socialists, social democrats, trade unions, as how we solve um, environmental problems. It doesn't uh, involve um, degrowth, limits to growth, holding back workers' wages, uh, workers' living conditions. Um, a great, and again, I, I, because this is quite theoretical, I want to give a really concrete example. In the 1980s, the last major, like properly existential environmental threat, the, the hole in the ozone layer, uh, people will remember, um, that was a result of our use of chlorofluorocarbons in a range of different industrial and commercial processes. People probably remember it as being used in fridges and cans of hairspray. There are many other processes that we use CFCs for, but that was the one that um, was in people. I remember saying to my mom as a kid, like, oh, you can't use hairspray, it's, you know, killing penguins. Um, <clears throat> if um, we had stuck to this sort of degrowth um, uh, agenda of limiting the amount of hairspray and, and fridges that we have, instead of technology regulating um, uh, uh, away from CFCs to other chemicals that were not causing the, the uh, depletion of stratospheric um, uh, ozone, um, we would just have um, less of a problem rather than eliminating the problem. Mm. It would be a slow, a more slowly burning problem rather than a, a rapidly uh, developing problem. Um, Thanks to regulation, which is a form of economic planning, which is a form of socialism, we have largely solved that problem by about 2050, mid-century. Uh, the um, uh, levels of uh, stratospheric uh, ozone should be back to historical levels, and we didn't need um, any limitation on fridges or cans of hairspray. If anything, there are more fridges and cans of hairspray than there have ever been before. And certainly on the fridge front, I mean, I don't really care about the hairspray, I use gel. Um, um, <laughs> As far as the fridges are concerned and air conditioning, thank God that more people on the planet have access to, uh, to fridges and air conditioning, these, these life-saving technologies. No, I, I mean, I think that that's like a really good example and a way to think about these things. It's like, you know, <clears throat> it's not technology itself that creates no. these problems. It's not, oh, that we've gone away from our natural state of affairs. That's the problem. Yeah. The problem is that we have a private system of control over things that have big effects. And as socialists, we should be saying, no, those should be democratically controlled and we should have much more influence on them than we currently do. And like anything else really is is just a complete retreat and like a foreclosing of the future, in my opinion. We're saying we'll never win that fight. So we just need to collectively suffer and, you know, hold hands and hope that the world doesn't burn. Right. Which I just think is just like a very... Like people always get mad at me because I focus on how bad of a political strategy that is, right? Which it is. Um, <laughs> but it's also it's just also a very depressing way to go about like the future when like we do have like I mean we're, there there needs to be this idea that like we can be producing more, we can be living better lives, that mm -hmm. our children will be living in a better world than the one that we left them. Which I think because of you know the devastation that we've seen politically on the left, um, you know people are quite pessimistic, and I think we need to you know reconquer that that kind of radical optimism that that we once had one radical optimism that's that's a lovely way to put it and uh you know well we we are all very i mean i think on the left we're very familiar with the uh in a way that liberals often aren't with the the sort of economic foundations of uh trumpism of marine le pen and the far right in france of um of you know the growth of the far right and 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 and, and right-wing populism and the de and how deindustrialization and growing inequality wage stagnation among uh, working people um is it's not one-to-one -one. it's not that like just because your uh your community has lost its 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 auto plant means that you're all voting trump now it's more complicated than that but nevertheless there is a it's not simply a matter of people 
uh, being racist or xenophobic, that there is uh, the, uh, the, the, the 40 years of neoliberalism is the underpinning of, of the growth of, of global Trumpism. Um, the, the promise that socialists have to, let's say, the flyover states or the um, Canada, the extractive center of Canada, or the deindustrialized northern belt uh, uh, above, above Paris that used to vote communists, never mind socialists, vote communists, and now is very strongly voting for the, uh, uh, the far right. The promise that we give to those people is very different from the, the promise that the degrowthers give. They, the degrowthers give, um, oh, you know how bad you have it? We're going to make it even worse. Our promise is we're going to restore industry. We're going to give good union jobs. We're mm. going to uh, promise a, a better life for your, your children. We're going to restore your communities. But um, it will take not markets as uh, left to their own devices. It will take a much stronger government uh, intervention, uh, regulation, economic planning, uh, stronger trade unions, that whole package of things. Oh, and by the way, we'll, um, we'll decarbonize much faster. Um, there is, that is the argument that I want the left to be embracing much more uh, openly and reject the, 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 the eco-thatcherism of um, an eco-austerity of degrowth, of the whole package of this package of ideas we're we already have a great solution mm -hmm. and also in in, pro, in in the process of doing that we're going some way to solving the issue of global trumpism i mean i just wanted to jump in real quick on the technology point like we've talked a lot about luddism and being like and reclaiming luddites as like people who are view technology not as something just to be knee jerkly resisted but to be interrogated in terms of and along like class lines. Um, whereas like, this is just like, it seems like the unthinking version of Luddite that we've all grew up with where it's like, no, no more technology. And it's just like, really? Like, I don't know. I got to say um, Bluetooth earbuds, been pretty cool. And like the impact like that's going to have on say um, hearing aids and stuff like that. Like, I don't know. When do we stop it? Do we stop it now? Okay. At least we've got like some of the hearing aid technology right now that's emerged in the last like five years or something like that. Like it, it, it's, it's a ridiculous uh, frame of mind. Yeah. I think the, the original Luddites, uh, it is unfortunate that their, their name has, has come to be synonymous with a uh, fear of technology. It was, as you say, Matt, uh, it was very different. It was an understanding of how technology was used by uh, elites to uh, to de-skill and undermine the living standards of, of those particular workers. And that's where our critique uh, sur uh, surrounds technology. Um, the difference here is that, th that there are people who think that technology itself is the thing that causes the problem rather than the social relations. I think this is a very non-Marxist, um, non-socialist understanding. I mean, obviously there are some technologies that um, we would, in a perfectly egalitarian world, uh, socialist world, we would not want. I think nuclear weapons is one of those. Um, but, you know, even that, it's a, um, the, the building the very first uh, uh, atomic weapons, um, you know, it was a bunch of socialists like um, Albert Einstein and Robert Oppenheimer um, who argued that the United States and the, the allied forces need to get, it, uh, get, get that weapon before Nazi Germany. I don't think that argument was wrong. I think that in that one ser one set of social relations, political and social relations, there was a utility, a very brief window of utility to uh, having the uh, the bomb uh, before before Nazi Germany did. Once um, Nazi Germany was defeated, those very same people, Albert Einstein and so on and so forth, became fervent anti nuclear um, um, uh, activists, or anti nuclear weapon activists, not anti nuclear energy activists. Um, so even that, this is going back to the discussion around Luddism, is that there may be some technologies that in almost 99.9% .9 of circumstances, uh, we would not want. So the technology itself, rather than social relations. Um, but even then, I, really, it's the social relations that allowed that last 0.1% um where uh, of a of a time period where you say okay yeah in this case actually th th anyway yeah I'm, I'm babbling here the point being focus on the social relations not the technologies itself right well thank you so much lee i really appreciate um you you taking the time and we got to cover a lot i know there's a hell of a lot more to get to and maybe sometime down the line we could get you back on to to break this down because i mean these these questions they 
they touch every facet of of our life both like on the basic level of how you you know cook your chicken at the end of the day or if you have chicken at all um to the politics as well so really appreciate it we'll have links uh, below for people to check out uh, your book and whenever you see lee's uh name pop up in jackman or the other magazines that he writes on you should definitely click that's always a thrill and uh, thrill and read thanks so much brother no thanks guys uh, thanks anytime. lee